Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm going to get things started. It's uh, 11 uh, on the dot. My name is Priscilla Phillips. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving at Golden Gate University, and welcome to GGU Presents. This is our ninth presentation in the series titled, There's No Going Back to Normal After COVID, Why Strategic Thinking is Needed Now. If you've attended a GGU Presents session before, this is different. Lori Silverman is making this an interactive hour. There will be no PowerPoint slides or a handout. So as I introduce her and the topic, please tell us in the chat area who you are, where you're from, and what you do. And if there's a topic that you'd like Lori to discuss or a comment that you'd like to make now or anytime throughout the hour, please let her know what that is in the comments. No matter where you live or work in the world, when the coronavirus made itself known, life as you knew it either went on pause, like it did for airlines or casino employees in Vegas, where Lori resides, shifted almost exclusively to online, like if some parts of retail, for example, or went to high gear if you work in healthcare or the grocery business. Will life go back to normal, or will there be a new normal once COVID weakens? How do you get people and organizations to think strategically long term when they weren't at all receptive to doing so before COVID? Lori plans to address these as well as your comments and your questions. Awarded GGU's Adjunct Professor of the Year in 2019, Lori teaches the only graduate course in the world on strategic thinking in an industrial and organizational psychology master's program. She's an internationally known keynote speaker and management consultant and the author of five books, three of which are bestsellers. Let me turn it over to Lori. Lori? Thank you so much. You know, I want to pick up on something that you just said is that before the coronavirus hit, not a lot of organizations were engaged in strategic thinking. So you really do kind of have to ask that question, why now? Why would people want to think and start embracing it? And I'm grateful to all of you who have joined me here today. And if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself, where you're from, a little bit about what you do. And as Priscilla said, if you have questions or comments for me along the way, please put those up on the chat. I have it open and I will be stopping um, along the way to address those comments um, from you. But you know, in, in my perspective, and I've been doing strategic thinking, oh my gosh, I was, I was reflecting on when did I first learn strategic thinking, and I think it was when I was 33 years old, and I'll talk about that situation a little bit later. Um, the, the thought that came to my mind was, I could easily just teach you the tools and techniques of strategic thinking, only strategic com thinking comes with a very, very specific mindset that most people aren't familiar with. So I think where I'd like to start is I'd like to start with some context and with actually working through what that mindset looks like with all of you. And then I'll talk with you about some of the tools and techniques that organizations have used and are using today. But to set that context, um, I found back on March 26th, I don't know how many of you saw a, a quote that Seth Godin put up that answers the question that was posed to him, is everything going to be okay? Allow me to read this to you, and then I'll spin off from here with what I think needs to be added to it. So in response to the question, is everything going to be okay, Seth Godin responded, that depends. And then he goes on to say, if we mean, is everything going to be the way it was, and the way I expected it to be, the answer is no. The answer to that question is always no, and it's always been no. On the other hand, if we mean, is everything going to be the way it is going to be? The answer is yes, of course. If we define whatever happens as okay, then everything will be okay. And then he goes on to say, given that everything is going to be the way it's going to be, which is quite philosophical, we're left actually with a useful and productive question instead, which is, what are you going to do about it? And that is your dilemma. And the reason it's a dilemma is because we are not in the world of fad diets, or even diets maybe that companies like Weight Watchers put out, where their belief is, just follow my direction, just eat the food that I'm going to give you. And I guarantee that over a 30, a 60, a 90 day period of time, your mindset is going to shift. The world that we're living in and have always lived in, and that's what Seth is recognizing here, is a one of where we need to shift people's thinking first. 
And when we shift their thinking, their behaviors will automatically start to change. And when their behaviors start to change, then the results that we see will start to change. So I want to start out by talking about a, a very key concept in strategic thinking called frames. Because in order to have a strategic thinking conversation, you both have to put forth your own frame and know what the frame is of the other person. Now, frames have to do with things like belief systems. So let me use the COVID example um, to kind of build this out a little bit. You know, we talk about, um, you know, that people can have a perspective around profitability. And we see this with COVID. There are a lot of people in organizations that are saying, why can't we open right away? We're losing money. Look at the economics of what's going on in our city, our state, or around the world. We need to do something about it. And then there are other people who have a people perspective. And they're like, nope, don't want to reopen. Safety and health of people comes first. And that's typically the mindset, you know, of people who are in healthcare and are actually in the hospitals 24-7, just as an example, to say, you know, we have to look at what I've been seeing on a daily basis, and I want you all to remain home. Whereas if I go back to the profit perspective, that's in the other one that I said, you know, I've got the mayor of Las Vegas who's been on CNN saying, you know, to Anderson Cooper and others, we need to reopen right now. But that's not where our governor is. But you could also take a third perspective, which is a planet perspective. You could say, what's in the best and highest good of everyone that's on this planet? You know, not just their health, not just their economics, but what about a social responsibility? Look at what's happening to the, the skies. Look at what's happening to the rivers because businesses are not operating right now. You know, places that were cloudy all the time all of a sudden have the ability to see the sun. And then there's a fourth perspective or a fourth frame that says, well, why can't we just embrace all of these perspectives? Why can't we attend to people or profits and people and the planet simultaneously? And that's a both and perspective, which is really key to strategic thinking. Now, where I come from and will for the rest of this hour, and I want you to start thinking about because your actions are based on your frame. Let me give you an example. Is there was a, um, I got a call. Uh, last week from one of my uh, former clients, and he lives in the Denver area. And he was telling me about a woman he knows who owns a salon. And she was very, very excited because she had gotten access to a payroll protection plan loan. And so she called up all of her employees and said, as soon as the state of Colorado allows us to reopen, I'm excited to tell you that I have the monies to pay you. And the way the PPP is designed, 75% of the monies that she got have to go to payroll. So whether or not there are customers in their place of business, she still is going to pay her people 100%. And I said to the man who was telling me this, his name is Gerald, I said, yeah, and that sounds really exciting. He said, well, the and was the employees all said to her, no, 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 we are not coming back to work. And she's like, what do you mean you're not coming back to work? And they're like, haven't you looked at unemployment? We make more money with the additional $600 every week that we're being given until July. Why in heaven's name would we want to come back to work? That's a difference in frames. Now, what that business leader didn't do was she didn't stay on top of communication with her staff. Right from the get-go, when this all let loose, to say, here is my mental frame of reference. Here is my intention for this business. I want to keep all of you employed. And here are the steps that I am going to take to make that happen. Because getting a PPP is not an easy process, I can tell you from experience. Yet, her employees embraced a totally different frame. Now, how do you even rectify that? Because they're at a standstill with what happens when she goes to reopen. Is she supposed to hire new employees? And does she tell them that they only have jobs for two months? What does she say to her current employees? Does she say, oh, you don't have jobs because you won't come back? And then that puts them, uh, continues to have them be on unemployment. It's a very interesting dilemma to face. So when I thought about this for myself, I said, what's the frame I'd like to bring to any conversation I have with people today about that question, what is it that you need to be thinking about? What are you actually going to do? And so here is my frame. My frame is, um, I, I don't believe in the phrase new normal. New normal suggests 
that there is one normal that's going to happen when this is quote unquote done. Well, this is not going to be done. I mean, I'm sad to tell you this, but as a strategist and a futurist, and I've been looking at data out to like 2040, this is not over. We were identifying already in the early 2000s that there were going to be a series of pandemics getting worse and worse and worse. The problem was that no one wanted to believe that that was the case and take action on it. So we in, are in a world where this, at least from a pandemic perspective, is not gonna go away. And you've got other things that are still changing. So I said to myself, well, what phrase would I like to embrace? And I like the phrase that McKinsey puts forth, which is they talk about the next normal. And the reason I say next normal is because there's gonna be a next and a next and a next, and you need to prepare yourself as an individual and the people that you're working with that there are going to be a continual series of shifts. Now the world has always been this way. It's always been chaotic. It's always been complex. Things have always been uncertain but the virus accelerated it and it allowed us to shine with a magnifying glass those particular qualities and characteristics which we've all wanted to ignore. So if we believe that there's going to be a series of next normals, then what does this mean to our behavior? And I sat back and I thought to myself, well, for me, what it means is that there's a now and the now changes. The now can change minute by minute. The now can change day by day. And today's now is tomorrow's yesterday. But there's always a now, a focus on the immediate presence. And at the same time, there's a focus on the next step. But then there's something after that. And I learned this from my friend Bill. A number of years ago, when I decided in my brain that I wanted to become a keynote speaker, it happened after my 1999 book came out. I was at uh, Bill's home in Seattle preparing for my, uh, it was my second keynote, and it was to 1,500 people, which is a huge audience when you think about it. And I said to Bill, oh, I did something that you aren't going to believe. At that time, I was completely wedded to what we know today as PowerPoint, but I knew as overhead slides. So this dates me, and I'm in my 60s. And I said to him, I have thrown away all my overhead slides. I'm not going to use a one in this presentation to people. And what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to just share what I think with them. And he said, well, why don't you share your presentation with me? You know, my wife and I have all evening. We'll listen to it. And if you want, we'll give you some feedback for tomorrow morning. So I did. And when I got finished, he looked at me and he said, when you threw away those overhead slides, you thought about the next step. He said, but what you didn't think about was the step after next. What are you going to replace it with? And I said, I don't understand. And he said, where are your stories? Where are your examples? People need those. They don't have anything else. They need to resonate with something. Now allow me to apply that to where we are today. We've got the now. We've got the next step. The step after next is way out here. It is not close by. If you put it close by, it doesn't look any different than the next step. So it's way out here in the future. And you've already heard me allude to that I do work with clients looking out to the year 2040. But it has to be, this base has to be really far out into the future. And this has to be almost like a beacon for you. Now, the challenge is, that what the coronavirus did was it accelerated the movement from now and next step closer to the step after next. And it upset a lot of people because if they were doing planning of any kind, if their step after next was really close, like I had a client a number of years ago who said to me, I refuse to do a strategic plan that's longer than three years in length. And I said, I'm sorry, I won't help you. I'm not gonna help you. I don't help anybody. They only wanna look out three years. And they said, yeah, but everything is too volatile. I said, not out here in the step after next, it's not too volatile. There's a lot of information about out here. And you can see patterns and you can see signals and you can see a lot of different things that will help to inform the decisions that you make today. Now you can choose to only look out three years, but I'm gonna tell you right now, something is going to come and bite you in the back end. And they said, okay, we'll make you a deal. Help us 
through this three-year planning process. And if in the three years, something comes back to bite us because you told us we didn't look out far enough, we promise to hire you again. And we promise to look at a five to 10 year plan. They came back within six months to have that conversation. And they said, we can't believe that it happened. And I said, it always does. That's because there are so many different dynamics and variables in the world around us. So in this frame, what I'd like you to be thinking about for yourself and the answer to that question that I posed to you early on is not just what do I do now and what do I do as the next step, but what's my step after next? And how am I going to start to articulate that? And if I haven't done any thinking around this, what sorts of tools can I grab from what Lori is talking about today to have these sorts of conversations such that when we understand this and we, have, we know what's going on over here, we can layer that into what this now looks like and make more informed, smarter decisions. So if you have some questions for me or if you'd like to make some comments, as I said, this is an interactive session, please feel free to put some comments into the box so that I can track along with where you are right now. Now, my observation about what's going on with companies is that people are still stuck in the now. I mean, some have pivoted. That's like the next step. You know, we have a window um, treatment company uh, here in Las Vegas that's making masks. We hear about, you know, distilleries that are making hand sanitizer and so on. And those are wonderful pivots. The only thing is they're not thinking about the step after next either. Like what, what are they going to do long-term? I mean, is that like their new business? I mean, are they always going to go from being a distillery to making hand sanitizer? Are they going to do that as a both and? Um, does that trigger other business ideas for them? And if they're not thinking about this out here, now you do not define this out here. This is defined by what other people, there are folks who are futurists who are talking about this. In fact, they're looking out to the year 3000. Um, your future consumers are defining this for you. In fact, I say to people, when you go to define a vision, vision is not even, you know, what do we want to become? Vision is what do our future consumers need us to become? And companies who had that in place were able to pivot a lot easier. Let me give you an example of this. So last it was May 1st, it was a Friday. Um, and when I write, I keep the TV on in the background because I learned a long time ago that it really helps like to focus my brain and kind of quiet some of the chatter and, and it turns out the distractions because I was telling Priscilla, I live right by the Vegas airport. And so I can hear planes taking off on a regular basis. And I heard, I heard on the screen, so I looked up, and I looked at the TV, um, an interview that was taking place with the president of Saks Fifth Avenue, and the guy's name is Mark Metric. And I was watching CNBC, and the video's actually up on the CNBC channel if you'd like to take a look. I think it's like six or eight minutes. I watched it again last night. And um, there were two commentators who were asking him a question, a man and a woman, and they were talking about, well, you're in the department store industry. Um, you must be in dire straits right now. And he said, but that's not our frame. Our frame, and he didn't use the word frame, so I'm adding to the conversation here. He said, our frame is we're owned by Hudson Bay. Hudson Bay is a real estate company. So we have a real estate company that also has some retail, some retail stores. We're not like Neiman Marcus, who's going to declare bankruptcy, and they already have, who's in the retail environment, the department store environment. We're a, realtor. We're a real estate company. We own billions and billions and billions of dollars of real estate. And then he said the following, and I just about fell off my chair. He said, we in our company have always believed in three chapters. He said, we're defining the second chapter a little bit differently today. He said, we talk about the now as being the present moment. He said, we talk about the, this next step as being re-entry, because he's thinking about the reopening of his stores, which are already starting to happen in a few cities. And then he said, this step after next, we talk about as the next normal. And he said, that's about ebb and flow. And I went, oh my gosh, he's been talking to McKinsey because McKinsey is responsible for the term next normal. And he said, but what I got to tell you is we were already prepared for something like this. Now think about the word he used. We were already prepared. They had anticipated shifts 
And they didn't anticipate that there was going to be a pandemic, but they anticipated a shift in the eyes of their future consumers. He said, for years, we have been creating a shopping experience for our consumers that's been personalized, where they, you know, we, we make appointments with them. It's easy and it's, and it's integrated throughout all of our channels. Everything flows together. He said, and also in order to prepare for any sort of upset in our system, we have zero debt. Now think about that. And he said, now you can compare us to the other department stores. They aren't in our same shoes. He said, so we were able to weather the storm because we were looking out further. And we understood that there were going to be ebbs and flows. He said, but we also understood our future consumer. So I want you to start thinking about what are you doing to anticipate and prepare for that step after next? You know, I tell my students, my graduate students, because a lot of them are former military, um, that the military is like in the U.S. is like the perfect example of this. Um, they... Are, have do preparedness exercises. In fact, the National Guard, I think, was even on 60 Minutes talking about in New York City that they had done preparedness activities around um, there being a major health issue. Now, they hadn't thought about the extremeness of what had happened in New York City, but they had prepared for it. Um, and they don't just think about a single scenario. They say, what are we going to do in peacetime? What's our role? And what do we have our, our troops do in peacetime? What do we do when there is a peacekeeping mission? What do we do when there is war? Or what do we do when there is a humanitarian scenario that we need to be a part of? And so the way that I look at it is I want you to imagine as though you're wearing a baseball cap that has four or more brims on it. And they switch it when someone says, today we're, this is what's going to happen. People just switch to a different brim on their hat and they know what their role is. Oops, tomorrow something's different. We switch what brim we have in the front and we move into a new way of being. And then, oops, a week or two later, something else shifts and we're able to shift again. That is the level of flexibility that we all need to be able to have going forward, is that ability to ebb and flow and to flex. Now, lucky enough for Saks Fifth Avenue, this is going to pay off handsomely. In fact, that one of the commentators said, are you gonna buy? Eamon Marcus, and he said, how the heck do I know if that's going to happen? But, um, you know, that's certainly something that I'm certain is kind of rolling around in their mind as they're doing the numbers and the economics of the situation, and it may or may not pay off for them. I guess we'll all find out. Um, now, what do you sometimes need to do as an individual? Because, you know, strategic thinking is an individual activity where people come together as a group and then also engage. On the individual side of things, Mindfulness and reflection is absolutely key. And allow me to give you an example. About a year ago here in Las Vegas, I was uh, meeting with a woman about some training programs that she was putting together for leaders in the local area. And she had a gentleman who was one of her um, investors join us. And he owns a group of physical therapy offices. And he's also a physical therapist by background. And I said to him, as we were um, just chatting casually and having our breakfast before I got into the nitty gritty of what we were meeting for, I said to him, how did you come to grow to the size that you're at today? And he said to me, if I tell you the story, you have to promise not to tell my wife. And I said, that's fine. I don't know your wife. So I promise not to tell her. And he said, well, he said, one day I just realized that my life was too busy. And I said to myself, I need some time for reflection. So he said, I am an exercise fanatic. And I said to my wife, um, I'm going to start exercising more in the mornings. I'm going to take like an extra 30 minutes to exercise. And she's like, fine, fine, fine. You want to get up early and you want to exercise, go right to it. He said, but I actually don't exercise for that 30 minutes. He said, I drive to someplace quiet. It could be a, a park, or it could be a parking lot for all that matters. And sometimes I don't even get out of my car. And I just sit and I just think, and I do nothing. And I wait to see what percolates up in my brain. And he said, I have found 
that my business has grown exponentially by me slowing down. Now, the brain research actually supports what he's doing. Because when we're so involved in this now, 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 go, 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 and all the distractions of what's going on here, this gets shut down. And it doesn't just get shut down in terms of activities, but it gets shut down in the brain. And so we know that there are brain exercises that we can do, one of them being mindfulness and reflection. That if we shut this down and quiet this, this voice starts to speak. And he said, I also read prolifically, which is really key to this too. And he said, and I just kind of meditate. I meditate on what has been going on. What am I learning? What's this kind of like real future going to look like out here? And then I get these insights because when you quiet the brain down, what comes to you is not so much intuition. Intuition is your experience speaking to you, but insight is truly something different. It's an aha. And, it, and it, when it comes, it's like fully formed in the human brain. And it's like, oh, that's what I need to do. And he said, when I started to do the things that were those ahas and those insights, my business grew. And before you knew it, I had several different branches. And he said, and we've been more successful than we've ever been all the years prior to me taking on this activity. So I'd like you to think about that's one way to do anticipation and to be prepared. But there's some more that we'll talk about as well a little bit later on. But I want you to think about what are you doing to prepare yourself? And again, if you have questions for me or comments or you'd like to add to the conversation and say, yeah, I do that too and I find it to be valuable, please feel free to do so. I'd love to engage uh, with you here versus it just being me having a, my own conversation. Um, the second principle um, I think got really illuminated for me over the last um, six weeks by something that happened. So I pretty much live on LinkedIn. And, and if you want to connect to me, that's the best place to find me. Um, but, um, and I browse. I browse LinkedIn all the time. And I don't just browse it for people and topics that I know. I browse it for things that are what, what we call in strategic thinking perking signals. And I have my hand purposefully out to the side because they're off here to the side. I might just see one of them, a comment from one person. And then maybe a day or two later, I might see a comment from someone else. And then over here, I might see something out of, you know, left field over here that's coming in. But these are all tiny little one-off signals. And I'm paying attention to them. And what I saw on this particular day, which was April 7th, and this was from a man I do not know. I do not even know how his post got into my feed. His name is Clint Clarkson. And he put up a post that said, hey, if I were to hold a two-day conference over the weekend of uh, May uh, um, 9th and 10th, and I were to do it virtually, let's say from like 7 in the morning until um, – two o'clock in the afternoon Pacific time. Would any of you, number one, want to speak? And number two, would any of you want to attend? Well, I kid you not. He literally, that post was flooded with comments, flooded. And that's what caught my eye. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments and thousands and thousands of likes and views. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? Now, he and I do not know each other, as I said, at all. And I'm doing perking signals, and it appears to me that he's doing the same thing, but he probably doesn't even know to call it that. So I write onto his post, I keynote around the world. All of my events for the next several months have been canceled. Many have not been rescheduled. I'd be happy to join you in whatever capacity I can. But if you have a keynote slot, that would be really lovely. And he writes me privately, and I connect to him as well. And he says, yes, we'd love to have you. There's a little form I need you to complete. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Now, Clint is, just to give you some reference point, he's 40 years old. And the reason I say that is because um, that defines him. Um, he really feels like he is at a turning point in his own personal life. And he has a company called Alchemy Lab. There's only five of them that work together, and they work in the e-learning space. So he decides immediately that he's going to put on this two-day conference. It's going to be virtual. Nobody's going to pay for it. And there's going to be donations and sponsors. But all the donations and sponsor money 
is going to go initially to food banks. That's what he wants to do. He wants to kind of do that triple bottom line piece. You know, how do I do good for people? How do I do good for the planet? Do right by the planet, but in terms of the profitability piece, how do I give back to other people? So now what I want to roll ahead to is what happened to Clint. So six weeks later, which was this past weekend, not only does he put on this conference and 1,500 people from across the world sign up for it and a Sunday morning when I keynoted early, I mean, there were 400, more than 400 people showed up on a holiday. Like, who does that? that? That was like me. I'm like, whoa, this is absolutely insane. But what I didn't know until everything was finished is that it had been a perking signal that Clint had seen that had caused him to put up his post. And that perking signal was at the, um, the association for Talent Development, which is the old um, ASTD, the Association for Training and Development, which has 30,000 members, 100 chapters around the world, had canceled on April 7th, that same day he put up his post. So this triggered him. They had canceled their international event called ICE. And what he did was he said to himself, because they didn't say, oh, we're going to put in a virtual event. They didn't do that at all. They just, they did nothing. And he saw an opportunity in that moment to do something different. Now, in terms of the frame that I've given you, the now, the next step, and the step after next, what did Clint see? He saw a pivot to the next step. But really, seriously, can five people put together an entire conference? I'm not talking about like a few speakers. I'm talking about four keynotes. I'm talking about two early morning sessions. I'm talking about three or four concurrent sessions over one hour segments throughout the day. We're talking a lot of people, a lot of moving parts. He's got to find a, an online platform to make this happen, which he did, which was Crowdcast. And he's got to teach all of us how to do it. And, and I, of course, come to him and say, I don't want to do a session by myself. I'd like you to facilitate it. So now he's got to like do that with me. And it all pulled off. Now, what do you think ATD did? A few weeks later, it saw what was going on. And it said, oh, we'll put up a virtual event for June but we're going to charge people $395. Now, I want you to think about which one is going to win this race. And how is it that the world's largest professional association for talent development, which would be training, learning, and development, didn't have on its radar screen a fully virtual platform for the step after next? They would say to you that they were blindsided. I don't think they were blindsided at all because Clint wasn't, neither was a lot of other people. And so what is that teaching us about strategic thinking? What it's telling us is that we need to keep our eye on the horizon. We have to. These perking signals are all around us. Now, if you want to get a feel for someone who's made a business out of this, go take a look at a website called Trend Hunter. That's Jeremy Goichi's firm. I just happened... Um, a couple of years ago, um, as my students know who are on this call, to have met Jeremy on an airplane. It was a late night flight from Atlanta to, I think it was to Phoenix when I was living in Phoenix. Um, I just happened um, to be upgraded to first class. He was already in his seat. I came in late. We were delayed by several hours. And, you know, I'm like thinking to myself, oh, it's 10 o'clock at night. Four and a half hours, I can snooze. And instead, this man to the side of me is like, hey, my name is Jeremy. Who are you? And he's like this bundle of energy. And I'm like, really, seriously? But I'm really glad that I chose not to nap instead. And when he's, and we were talking about what we were doing, and he said, oh, yeah, you know, I have this company, and I wrote this book. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're Jeremy Goichi. I have your book. I know your business. And so he told me the inside scoop of his business. And it's a company that is solely designed in the market research area around perking signals in a crowdsourcing manner. So when he was a kid, Jeremy's father was a, an entrepreneur um, and they lived in Canada. And he would, his father would come home and, and every week on Sunday afternoon, he would dump magazines onto the table. And he would say to the family, page through the magazines and see if you see anything in it that's new and different, that just really catches your eye. So mom did this, dad did this, and the kids did it. 
And then they would take all of the items and they'd set them in the center of the table. And they would have this conversation as a family. They would have a strategic thinking dialogue session just to say, huh, what did you observe? What made you pull that out? That looks interesting. What do you think that is? Oh, if we put these five pieces together, could we connect the dots in different ways? And what, what might this tell us about what the future could look like? And Jeremy said, as a result of this, his father started many, many businesses. He's a serial entrepreneur. Some were wildly successful and some were bust. He said, but that mentality stayed with me through the years, such that when I got my MBA and I went to work for a bank, and they said, can you work in innovation for us? And can you create a new business for us? He said, I did just that. And after I made them like hundreds of millions of dollars, I thought to myself, why am I doing this for someone else? Why am I not doing this for myself? He said, so I stopped, I quit, I opened Trend Hunter. And I decided that what I would do is I would find people, and he pointed to me, he said, I find people like you all around the world. And I'd say, what are the perking signals that you find? And you can do this. You can actually be this person for Jeremy. And then you can write in all these different, like really unique things that you see everywhere in the world. And then what he now has is he has an engine, a software engine technology that can start to aggregate all of these different perking signals and start to look for patterns and start to look for outliers. Because folks, the challenge is, is it's not so much the patterns and trends that make the difference. It's those one off outliers. Go back to the Clint Clarkson's of the world. That one person who just says, well, why can't I do that? I don't see any barriers to doing that. Nothing's going to stop me from doing that. Not even money. And then they go and they do it. And they become the next competitor in a particular market. So that is what Jeremy has created, is this huge crowdsourced piece such that it's now grown to the point. And he has many, many, many companies who have marketing subscriptions, research subscriptions with his firm that they can give him a question. So um, I'll give you an example that might not, might not be applicable going uh, forward. And by the uh, way, uh, Sherry's asking me, can you provide the name of that website again? It's Trend Hunter. And I don't have the website address, but just put that into your search engine and it'll come up. And Jeremy Goichi. Um, but now what he can do is, um, let's say that Let's say that we still were able to go to the movie theaters. By the way, that probably isn't going to happen for a very long time, um, unless there's like private showings of movies. But let's say that Disney was going to come out with a new uh, version of Frozen. And it said to itself, in fact, it could even do this now. It could put it out on its Disney channel, right? Because now it's got a subscription service that's gone live. And Bob Iger's returned to the company to try to save it. Um, and they could say, well, when this movie goes live on the Disney channel or in the movie theaters, we think that girls between the ages of eight and 12 will watch it. Okay, so what sort of candy those, do those girls eat? What sort of foods do those girls eat? And that's what will be stocked in the candy area of a movie theater or in your store. Because that will trigger people then as a story trigger to remember the movie, to remember the company, and to want to come back again. So he now can turn around research. If you come to him and say, what would that candy be? He can turn that research around for you in 24 to 48 hours. He doesn't need any time at all. And I want you to think about what traditional market research takes for people. So what he's learned and he's practiced as an entire business is how do we pay attention to the perking signals that are on the horizon, on the fringes of what's around us in this step after next. Now, you might be saying to yourself, how far out on the horizon do you want us to look, Lori? Um, when I was um, 32 years old, I worked for a consulting company. Um, and this was in the area, in the, in the uh, uh, era of uh, total quality movement. So I worked for a company that was affiliated with W. Edwards Deming. And for the small firm that I was a part of, because I don't, I kind of do things my own way. You can probably guess that right now from the conversation. Because I do things my own way, I um, was wildly successful. I was the most uh, top building consultant. Um, I had a team of people who worked with me and everything we did for our clients that we were responsible was just out of the norm, but it worked. It worked. I mean, it got to the point where when I was very young that I you know, actually had the opportunity to spend time with the chairman of Chevron and his top 52 executives. I mean, when you're in your early 30s, that's like, wow, sort of things. Um, and uh, the company decided they were going to send me to Japan for three weeks on a, a study mission with just a few of our clients and some of my colleagues. 
And that was my gift. And they were hoping that I wouldn't resign because my contract was coming up for renewal. But anyways, um, one part of this trip, we were at a resort. And what was interesting about this resort was we were told not to bring our suitcases. We didn't need to bring any clothes. You could bring a toothbrush and that sort of thing, you know. But we didn't, that we would be given our clothes upon entry. And we had the choice. It was um, uh, glow in the dark colors. You could get lime green, orange, um, or yellow. And for women, if you get dresses and flip flops, for men, it was a top and pants and flip flops. So everybody looked the same. And on our first evening, the general manager of this particular facility was going to have a meeting with us. Now, one thing to know um, at that time about the Japanese is that you never interrupt their conversation to ask a question. Um, you, their belief is that you wait until the end, and if you wait until the end, all your questions, or most of them, will have been answered. And what they had done at the same time was we were sitting on the floor on tatami mats, and I had this huge tray of food in front of me. I mean, all the delicacies you could think of, along with some sake. And I heard the general manager say, as I was kind of making things for myself, um, yes, we are the spa resort Hawaiians, but we used to be the Joe Banco Mining Company. And I thought to myself, did I hear him right? Or is it the sake? So I kind of leaned over as, as uh, nondescript as I could to my uh, woman colleague and I said, uh, Sharon, did, did he just say that they were like the Joe Bank coal mining company? And she said, yes, he said that. And he's like, there was a point as the Joe Bank coal mining company that we realized through our very long-term strategic thinking exercises out here that there wasn't enough coal in the ground to employ our children's children. Now, I want you to think about like how long that would be if you think about lifespan, that's like a hundred years. They were like thinking out way out here. He said, so what we decided to do was we decided to sit down and say, what is it that we do have that is pro problematic to us, that could be a gift to us, that could be a strength to us. And when we look at what people are saying about this future world in a hundred years, what are they also saying about what will be going on? And they decided that when they mined for coal, they always hit hot springs. That was problematic in the mining business. They also realized that the land that they owned, which was plentiful, was not mountainous. It was hilly. It was like rolling hills. You could walk the rolling hills. And little by little, while they still mined coal, they created, literally inside the company, the Spa Resort Hawaiians. And no employee lost their job. Now, what they were doing is what Michael Tushman and Charles O'Reilly would call structural ambidexterity. And what they defined this as is simultaneously, at the identical time, exploiting what it is that you have while you're exploring the opportunities for the future. And these have to be done at the same time, what some people call bifocal vision. Because if you don't do one or you let go of both or they're out, out of whack over here, you won't get the benefits of both. So for several years, as they continued to mine coal and be an award-winning company in terms of their quality, they were also reinventing themselves. I went onto their website last night to see if they were still in business because they were close to where the earthquake was in Japan a couple years ago. They are still in business. They talk about their history and all the steps that they went through and how things have changed over time. But how crazy it is that some of the employees became members in their orchestra. Some of the employees became spa folks. Some of their employees did other work, but you know, the, he said maintenance is kind of like maintenance. You know, those people didn't have to switch their jobs so much. He said, but imagine, you know, we have people who are singing and dancing, and we had to find talent within our existing workforce because we were not going to get rid of anyone. And that's what we have to start thinking about now. We always needed to think about this. We always did, but even more so now, because with COVID happening, as I said, we got, we got jerked. 
into the step after next, but no one wants to really think about it because they got their eyes down thinking about the crisis. I have to, you know, solve all the financials that go with it, all the things I got kids at home, you know, going to school and oh, by the way, school's not going to reopen again. And how do I make all this like all come together? But you can't take your eye off of this. And they did not. Now, a company who did take their eye off of that would be GM with Saturn. You know, they did the same thing. They actually thought out a lot of years and they said, we're going to open this plant in Smyrna, Tennessee. We're going to call it Saturn and we're going to stay in Detroit. <laughs> but because they never integrated the two together and they didn't make that shift to become one organization in terms of their mindset, what eventually happened? Saturn was shut down because the mothership will always win. It might take years and years and years and years, but that's where the power is always held. Whereas the Joe Van Coal Mining Company actually made a full and complete transition so they could have a singular mindset, a single way of looking at the business. And I want you to think about what that must be like now when people cannot travel and what the benefits are of being the Spa Hawaiians Resort. Now, what I want to do, and you'll need a piece of paper for this, is I want to start to put together all of these different principles and concepts into a diagram for you because I wanna to start to get more specific and tangible about what it is that you need to do. So um, I started to do my drawing, it looks like this, and I would like you to draw the same thing on your sheet. So I'd like you to draw like a big box, I don't care, it doesn't have to be square or anything, put like a circle in the middle and then put out four arrows. And as you're drawing that, I am going to put some words in this diagram for you that we are going to start thinking about. Now, in the center circle, the small center circle, you can put the letters ST because that's going to stand for strategic thinking. And then where the upper left arrow is, I want you to draw another circle. And inside of it, I want you to put the word visioning. And then in the upper right, I want you to put another circle that says strategy formulation, and then in the lower right, I want you to put the words strategic planning, and then in the lower left, I want you to put strategy implementation. So your chart should start to look something like this. Now, what I also want you to do is I want you to put the letter D into each of these outside circles. Do not put it in to the strategic thinking piece, and I'm going to put this in there too. And if you want to make a little note off to the side for yourself, the D stands for strategic decisioning. So here is our conceptual map. And by the way, visualizing and drawing pictures is a key tool of strategic thinking. So now, what's this telling us? Strategic thinking is a set of activities and a separate mindset that happens prior to these four sets of activities and the results of strategic thinking can inform them. Now it's an iterative process. We might do some strategic thinking, then we might go off and do some visioning. We might do some more strategic thinking. From there, we might go off and create, um, we might do some strategy formulation. Um, we might come back to strategic thinking and then we might go off and do our strategic planning process and so on. But strategic thinking, and allow me to give you a definition of these words, it is not the same as any four of these. There is no decisioning that takes place. There is no judgment that takes place. There can be some processing of the conversation that comes up. But it's truly through dialogue as a conversation style that strategic thinking starts to emerge. So the definition that I use is that strategic thinking is a dynamic which means ever evolving, divergent, meaning we're creating choices, we're not minimizing them. So it's a dynamic, divergent, deep, because we're really doing some deep thinking, nonlinear, so going back and forth and we're going all different places to explore, iterative, because we're revisiting ideas, 
imaginative and holistic process for being curious about and exploring possibilities, options, and operating environments in the future within the larger ecosystem. And I'll repeat this so you can pick up the words. So strategic thinking is a dynamic, divergent, deep, nonlinear, iterative, imaginative and holistic process for being curious about and exploring possibilities, options, and operating environments in the future within the larger ecosystem. Now, sometimes people say to me, do our brains allow this to happen? And the answer is yes. There's a book that's called Making Your Brain Smarter that has activities in it for how you can increase your strategic thinking muscles. I used to say to people, you know, if you looked at the results of the Myers-Briggs and you did that within the realm of temperament, personality temperament, of which there are four temperaments, only about 20 to 25% of people are naturally predisposed to think strategically. Then you've got another 45%, 40 to 45% who always thinks in the past. That's not even on my, my continuum. Um, and then you've got another 30, 35% who always think in the present moment. But every single one of them has the capacity to think strategically. And I do want to clarify, strategic thinking is not critical thinking because there's no analysis work that is happening. So let me talk in the remaining minutes and feel free to ask me some questions along the way. I've been giving you some tools to think about as we've been going through this. I'm talking about how do you do reflection? You know, how do you look for perking signals? How do you um, do visualization? You really need to start drawing out. What does it mean to stating your frame to other people and what is their frame? You know, you get at people's frames by asking questions and getting at the underlying assumptions and the unexpected long-term consequences of what you're going to do. Um, in terms of the traditional activities that are done for um, strategic thinking, um, one is environmental scanning. Um, so let me give you um, two quick examples of this. Uh, in 2011, I was working for Philips North America doing a consulting project for them. And there were a number of primary stakeholders and they did not agree, and they hadn't in many months, on where a particular large program was going and all the different projects that were a part of it. And after I'd been on site a couple of weeks, my project time there was very short. It was like three days a week for like three months. But I said to the program manager, I think we need to do an environmental scan. And she said, I don't know what you mean by that. I said, we need to collect some articles about what the workplace of the future is going to look like. Because what we were doing was an employee branding program. We were looking at how could we bring in new hires into the organization that were not skilled when the workforce itself retires. And they were expecting about a 30% drop in retirement um, in a particular like two or three year period. And uh, I said, we're going to look at what the workplace of the future looks at. We're going to get everybody to agree on what they think at least one possible workplace of the future looks like. And then we're going to use that to back into our program plan and say, what are the sorts of changes that we need to make? And we did that. We did that actually in a day. We got like four or five articles for them. They read them. They had a, a dialogue session, strategic thinking dialogue session to, to kind of understand that world. And then we said, okay, what are the implications? What are the implications? So now they're starting to say, okay, what does that mean to this particular diagram and to the plans that we already have in place? They made some um, accommodations, some changes, and they were able actually to get out of being unstuck and to accelerate. Now, if I'm doing this for an organization, we're going to pick a year in the future. We're going to pick maybe the year 2030. Um, we might use a framework. Um, some people use a framework. Uh, one is called PESTLE. Um, and those initials are P-E-S-T-L-E. -E. P stands for political, E for environment, S for social, T for technology, L for legal. And then the final E, -E can be for economics or ethics, or whatever you want it to be. And you can add more to this. And then what we do in each of those categories is we write four or five questions 
about the year 2030 that if we had a crystal ball, we could have the answers to. Because we're not trying to predict the future, we're trying to anticipate the future. We're trying to prepare for it. And then based on the answers, and we collect articles, there's tons of articles that you can collect out there, we'll hold a strategic thinking dialogue session to talk about what is this telling us and what are the implications? Do we see any trends? Do we see any outliers or perking signals, wild cards, risks, and things like that? And then once we have all of that delineated, we can do one of two things. We can either take that and believe there's gonna be one single world, which is risky to do, but we can take that into strategic planning, or we can say, oh, we think the P is political, yes. Um, and, uh, or we can say, oh, there's gonna be multiple worlds, let's go do strategic, let's go do scenario planning. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll go out beyond 2030, like maybe another five years, and we'll say, what's the one question we would like to have answered in that year? So let me give you a quick example of this. Um, I was working a few years ago with the YMCA of the Inland Northwest, and they involved over 50 people in the community in this process from all over the place, as well as their leadership. So we had like a cross section of lots of different folks because they wanted to add to the knowledge base of the community. And as we were going through the environmental scan, but particularly when we were doing the scenario work and talking about the different stories and the different scenarios that were coming out, the question we had used was in advance, how will people live, work, and play in the Inland Northwest? And at the time that we did this, I think we used the year 2025. Um, but as we were doing this and we were putting up information around the room, someone in the room had this like epiphany. It was an insight and they went, oh, Oh no, oh no. And the executive director said, what? Can you tell us when we sit down again? And the person said, we just completed a capital campaign to build a bunch of brick and mortar YMCAs around the community. And this data doesn't support it going forward. And the CFO said, well, darn good thing. We haven't put the shovel on the ground yet. We only own the land. And what they created as their breakthrough based on this step after next, was what they called mobile why. How do we take the why to the people? Now I want you to think about what that must be like today because they're taking the why to the people. The people don't have to come to their buildings. And that was for them a huge revelation. That is what these exercises can do for you. They can get you to stop. They can get you to think about, oh my gosh, are the decisions that we're making today or the decisions that we've made in the near recent past the right decisions. And if they're not, let's shift. Let's shift this so it aligns with what this world and this world of possibilities look like. I know we're in the last couple of minutes. You've been a, um, a wonderful audience. I want to just remind you about how we started. And the question that um, Priscilla asked was, how do we get people and organizations to think strategically long-term when they weren't all that receptive to doing so before COVID? And I added to that. What are you going to do about it? So if, we, um, if you're open to doing so in the chat box, I'd like to know what are the takeaways and the things that you're going to do going forward um, within your own life, because you, know, you can apply this personally. Um, I have, that, that's actually how I got to GGU, is um, um, a few years ago, I um, stopped myself and I said, what do I want to do at age 70? And my friends all said, but 70 is a long ways off. I'm like, yeah, you don't understand. If I don't plan for 70 out here, then I'm not going to do the sorts of things that I need to do out here. And that's actually how I got uh, to Golden Gate uh, to teaching. Um, uh, and um, so I, I'm looking to see if there are any comments that are coming in. I do see Sadie has introduced herself to us. Priscilla, is there anything that you wanted to add as we're uh, completing? Um, our show for today. I appreciate all the t tools that I'm implementing and, um, and in my life and my professional life. Lori, thank you so much. I mean, for, for, for how I'm implementing, like in the horizon, for example, DG presents, that's how we got to this idea that uh, we were not going to be able to engage with our community of alumni students and community members in person. And then, so that's why we transitioned to these online events and, um, uh, I, I didn't know that's what I was, uh, the framework the, of my thought, but I appreciate now having the vocabulary. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're welcome.
Well, we are now at the, the, at the top of the hour. So Lori, thank you so very much for your time uh, and then for the wonderful presentation. You're welcome. I'm seeing in the chat box some really wonderful things that people are doing. So I hope that folks continue to add to it. And um, as I understand, this video will be up on YouTube, right, in a, in a little while. So if they wanted to watch it again or recommended to their friends and colleagues that it would be available to them. Absolutely. It'll be shared on the GG Presents website uh, on YouTube. And, um, and I'll send a link to everybody who registers. Thank you. And thank you for your time today. Lori? Yes. Kai here. Um, I think my question might be a little selfish, but uh, you know, I'm all in about you know finance and how the global economy works. But uh, so my qu question is kind of long, so I post it in the box here. Okay. But it, so my thought is right. Um, money printing, right? Our central banks are work based on inflationary, right? So right. always creating money, and the world right now, every government are printing money. Right, but technology is deflationary, right? So it causes services, products, and things like that to reduce in price, right? So it's more efficient, it's getting better. So uh, I guess the question really is about how, how do you see or you think the world central banks, right? These are like, like the Federal Reserve, right? We have one in San Francisco, for example. How do you think they're going to be dealing with this global glut of money, really, that's printing out there. And it's going to cost everything to be more expensive. Yeah, it is. I think that what you've actually written, Kai, is a wonderful scenario question. And so what I would encourage you to do is to think about, you know, what are two uncertainties that you want to matrix? to create four different possible scenarios. And in each of those scenarios, if you look at, like you say, let's do the year 2030, right? Because you can't use today's data to answer that question. You're gonna have to look at the um, uh, content from like the year 2030. And I think, um, so for the rest of you, Kai was one of my students. You have articles that I've given you about the year 2030 and you've already made a list of uncertainties and trends. Take your scenarios and start to play out. How might that question get answered within them? And then what you have to figure out, because this is the key, the key is to have a strategy that surrounds all of those possible scenarios. Because you don't want to pick one. If you pick one, you're going to get blindsided by the other three. And I think that if you kind of look at the totality of them together and then say, if all of these were to happen, what could the world look like? You're probably going to get closer to what the truth is going to be. And then say, what does that mean to the short term? Does that make any sense? Yes. Yes. Because it's, I, I think that it's so volatile right now that any one of those scenarios could likely play out. And you're going to have to start looking for perking signals for each one. So I might say if I have my four scenarios that are planned out, and for the rest of you who are listening, if you'd like to know the process of scenario development, please reach out to me um, privately, and I'm happy to share that with you. But if you have these four scenarios, just say what are two or three signals I'm going to look at in each of the four. And I'm going to track them. And then you're going to be able to see which ones are really playing out. Okay. I, I don't can... think it's going to be easy, but I think it's going to be wildly fascinating. And, yeah. and, and I would start, if I were you, because I know you write well, I would start writing some papers on this and getting your colleagues involved. Yes. Yeah. I apologize. I missed the, um, the, the talk with Clint. So definitely got to go back and look at that video before attempting this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lori, for your time. Oh, you're welcome. But it's a great, great scenario question. And someone said, sounds like cryptocurrency is calling your name. And Kai would say, yes, that is indeed the case. <laughs> um, Lori, I wonder if I might jump in with another yeah. question here as well. I enjoyed yeah. the presentation. Thank I wanted you. to go back to an earlier point that you raised at the beginning about sort of taking your deck of slides and material and so on, a lot of the content and stories and examples um, that I'm sure you've used over your career, and sort of tossing it aside. Um, you know, to rethink uh, how you approach the, the strategy process. I'm wondering if you, is your expectation that eventually you'll resurrect some of that or a lot of the things that, you know, we understood about strategy, strategy formulation, uh, you think need to be sort of completely rethought? So question is sort of how much of what we've learned in business over the last 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, you know, do we retain? 
and I mean, how do we need to sort of come back and rethink? I think that, um, so I'm going to hold this up again. Um, and I don't know if you can see me, um, but I do want to see you as you're talking to me. I think we've got to we've got to do this piece in the center. I think that's the piece that has been forgotten. And strategic thinking, you know, is the the newest kind of discipline that's been added to this mix. And my sense is that, that if we don't start doing it before these other steps, we're not going to inform them. But I um I also think that there's an issue around nimbleness because you know the um the tech industry tried to tell us with Y2K, oh, we don't have to do any of this stuff, right? We're just gonna toss all this out. This is all hogwash. And they did, they were pretty successful at it. And I wanna say, look at where it's gotten them today. Um, a lot of them, I mean, I haven't talked about data here, but um, all, right, all historical data right now is suspect. If you are doing any sort of forecasting work, you are doomed. And if you are using AI and machine learning, I have an article as recently as this morning from MIT Tech Review that says it is flawed. Every single thing that people are doing is flawed um, because these, um, the models were not trained with disruptive data. And so to the point, was that Anthony who was talking to me? Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So Anthony, I, I think that what we have to relook at is all the, we can't use forecasting anymore. That's for doggone certain. And even with this frame of reference, when I talk about, you know, you will never be able to forecast your way into the step after next. It just doesn't work. And we have been of the mindset that you could. But this is for the work I'm talking about is foresight work. And so I think what you have to go back and look at is, are the frames and the, and the, and the, the models and the steps that you've been teaching or other people have been teaching, have they been informed by forecasting or by foresight? And if they've been informed by forecasting, they aren't going to work anymore. I mean, I have, um, I'm on the Boston Globe, a Slack group for the Boston Globe uh, small business owners. They allowed me, even though I live in Vegas, to be a part of it. And um, the, uh, there was a woman, uh, a restaurateur, she must own several restaurants, and she put up, she said, I'm doomed. All the models we have are based on historical data, which no longer works. And what am I supposed to do? How do, I, how do I do anything? How do I do staffing? How do I buy supplies? How do I buy food? How do I go to market? I mean, she said everything's up in the air. And so I think we have to build that into our frameworks. Does that help me to understand how that resonates with you? Well, I, I go back to a lot of the, you know, the assumptions and, and beliefs and concepts you know, that we sort of put at the forefront of, of strategy. I was just you know, thinking recently about some of the work of Thomas Friedman who, what was it, maybe 15 years ago, you know, tried to get us to think about how the world was changing and, yeah. you know, suggested that the world is flat. You know, we're moving into a globalization environment. I don't think 15 years ago he would have thought that, you know, all of a sudden our ability to, you know, to travel around the world, you know, would have been you know, broken the way it has now. And so, you know, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these assumptions about, you know, the way the world was going to evolve and what the future would look like, uh, I'm wondering how much of that, you know, we have to completely rethink uh, as opposed to bake into our strategy formulation process. Yeah, but see, my, my clients, I mean, when I worked with the American College of Veterinary Pathologists in 2002 and 2005, we knew that pandemics were coming. But because we were doing, we were doing foresight work. We were doing the scenarios. We were looking at trends going out 15, 20 years. And so I think to your point, what people have to recognize is we have a set of us, if, if they only work off of their own mental model and they bring in no data about the future and they sit in a room and they say, what do we think we should do? That immediately is myopic. And those assumptions are by definition flawed because you cannot on your own understand what this future is out here. There are people whose lives are devoted to actually looking at 2030, 2040, 2050, the year 3000. And that's where I go. And I say to teams, we're not going to use any of our own opinion stuff. We're going to interpret this. We're going to use your brains. We're going to work them hard. But I want the data to come from over here in this world. And then we're going to look at it and say, oh, what's the implications of this to today? What's the implications of this to five years from now? But if we walk into a room and all we're using is our own mental models, we're 
we're using forecasting because all we have is our own human experience to draw from. And very few of us are like Steve Jobs, where we're just individually brilliant and visionary. Does that help a little bit? Absolutely. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's a very insightful question, as was Kai's. Very insightful question. Um, other questions? Uh, I, I know somebody put up here about how can we assist vulnerable communities uh, strategically with the economic shifts. Um, I would do what um, uh, some folks have done um, in Toronto that I've worked in. They've brought the leaders of those um, of the group of the organizations that help those vulnerable communities together, and they've done this strategic thinking work together so that there is a coordinated effort inside of the community about how to approach the shifts that are happening. Now, what we can't negate in all of this is people are going to say to us, but look at the sky is falling today. The sky is falling today. Yes, I understand. The sky is falling today, and you got to put a tourniquet on what's happening here. Because, you know, if you got someone on the street who's been hit by a truck and their leg is bleeding, profusely, you're not going to say to them, hey, what would you like to become in 15 years in your career choice? Because that question is meaningless. But once you put that tourniquet on for whatever time it takes, you know, maybe it's tourniquets on for two weeks, you have to start to do this strategic thinking work to say, what is this future going to look like? Because whatever decisions we make today also has to live over here. And the challenge that we have is, and I see this with businesses all the time, because I've worked across 25 industries with lots of companies, there's a 10 year window. What I mean is the decisions you make today will not fully play out for 10 years. And someone else is going to inherit the results of that. And so what I say is let's be mindful and let's be kind. Let's inform our current decisions with what the future says so that these people aren't here, aren't caught with a mess because a lot of them today are caught in messes because of the decisions others made. Um, someone has um, asked me here, um, living in Vegas, a city focused on making money off of uncertainty, what are your thoughts on sports betting? Um, my thoughts on betting in general is that um, online betting um, is going to be the wave of the future. I don't, um, uh, and what you see happening, which I think is really kind of cool, I don't know if you've been watching TV, but um, this is on like on Sundays, they are doing these like virtual races, like with race car drivers, um, you know, in these simulated situations and people are actually betting on them. I think we're going to get really, really creative with artificial intelligence um, and what's going to happen. I am a sports fanatic. Um, so I am sad that we will probably not be sitting in any sort of stadium, whether it be tennis or uh, college or, or regular um, NFL football here in the U.S. or soccer, or um, uh, for me, um, it, my big music concerts as well fall into that. But um, other than that, in terms of the sports betting, I did get the opportunity to work with someone in London in November who actually works for one of the largest sports betting organizations in the world. They are in a very tiny little country that will remain unnamed, but um, they have been looking at this whole issue of uh, what, will, what will the future look like. Um, doesn't look as good as people would like it to be, but I think it's gonna move far more into technology. Um, uh, someone else asked, Doris asked me, what international trips do you have planned? Um, I actually have one planned um, to Brussels in October. I started to write the letter yesterday to my event planner. It was postponed from March. They are still believing that it's going to happen. I have itchy feet, so I would love to be on an airplane. I've been reading a lot about what the future of transportation will potentially look like and that it could take us up to four hours within an airport to be screened. Um, we are likely going to even need what they call a passport, like a sickness passport that says either I've had the antibody test and I have the antibodies, um, or I've been uh, sick with COVID, uh, or I've had the vaccine. I'm in a, um, a dilemma because I am uh, going to be 62, but I have not been ill in years, knock on wood, with the flu or anything else because I don't get the flu shot. I have an allergy to eggs, so I, I, most of the base of vaccines are in eggs. Um, so I, you know, if I sit here and I go, which one of these three am I going to go into? I'm already looking at, can I get the antibody blood test done so that I can have a sheet? Um, but I will probably 
if I'm allowed to try to take the trip if my event planner is flexible on some things. If not, we're going to engage in the conversation around how can I keynote and do a workshop from afar. They believe that people need to physically come together, but you know the, the dynamics and assumptions in Brussels right now are different than they are in the US. Um, and we don't have any planes leaving the airport. There haven't been any that have left in the time that I've been talking to all of you this morning and I'm just kind of looking out the window. Um, and is there anything else that you would like to ask me? These are all really great questions. And I would love to continue the conversation offline with you as well. I know someone said in here that they're getting more creative about how to use video and other media to create a new direction to solve our old problem. Absolutely. Uh, that uh, meditation and prospecting for perking signals. These are all really wonderful comments. Thank you. I think, I think just one, just one last one. Sure. Right, guys. Um, so you, you do a lot of events, right? Uh, have, have you seen any uh, application of like AR technology, like, uh, you know, in events that you do? Not in, um, my event planners aren't so that sophisticated yet, uh, but there are events and there are platforms where that's being used where you can actually um, pick your, um, like, I don't know, what would you call it, your persona, but you actually look like a character on the screen. So I do, um, you'll laugh at me, but I, um, when I need my mind to rest, I uh, play um, slot machines online. And in one of the games that I'm currently playing, I actually have a figure that I've chosen that I look like with my face on it that stands in a room and decides which slot machine I'm going to walk to. And um, there are meeting platforms that actually have that already. It's just a matter of the event planners and the companies using them, but they can go into, uh, you can go into separate rooms. You can have one-on-one -on -one chats with people. You can have networking. You can have vendors at expos, talk to the folks, and you can have a variety of sessions, which are also occurring at the same time. So I think that we're going to see more of that going forward. I don't think it's going to be an either or world. I think it's going to be a both hand. I do think that we will get back to travel because we have, to, and we will figure out how to do it in a way that's beneficial for everyone. That will make the airlines money, keep the airports open, keep the um, lounges open for people who do travel regularly. But we also have this other option out here. So I think it's just going to increase the amount of interactivity and human connection that we have with people. But we're going to do it differently. Okay, I've got another question here. What's your thought on nonprofit performing arts marketing strategies with performing arts such as ballet at a standstill? Organizations are frantic to stay afloat. Um, have you been following um, TDK in uh, New York? Um, they uh, have been doing something absolutely phenomenal. And Rosie O'Donnell um, did a, a special a couple weeks ago on this. And she, I think she used uh, the StreamYard platform to actually... Um, get this viewed onto TV because it looks like the it's a, it's a, a technology platform I use when I do my LinkedIn live shows. Um, so the, the question becomes, and this is where the challenge is, was anything videotaped in the past? Were, were um, practice sessions done? Were um, entire shows videotaped? Um, that's one thing to start looking at and how can you uh, allow your patrons to revisit those? Um, you could also do, I've seen um, conversations where artists of all different backgrounds are individually holding conversations. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. This is in the music industry. So last week, Friday night, I'm, um, I go to Coachella Music Festival by myself. And last Friday night, Cascade decided that he was going to hold a viewing party. And the last time that he was at Coachella was 2015. And he did it in his house. It was absolutely brilliantly done. He um, was sitting on a sofa with one of his guy friends, and then his wife came over, and there was a guy behind him who was running. You could see all the equipment. And he said, I'm going to talk to you about what was going on before my 2015 show. And I'm going to give you history all the way back to 2006 when I was first at Coachella. So I'm going to talk about 2006, 2009, 2012, and 2015. And I'm, and I'm just going to give you all these different personal stories about what's going on. And so he gave us all these personal stories. Then they actually live streamed the 2015 show to all of us. It wasn't live streamed. It was a tape stream. Um, and so we had to have gotten permission from Coachella for that because he, and, and from the music producers because the music is not his own. He would be 
in every so often and say to us, this is what was going on. Or, oh, did you notice I just took off my shoes? And the audience members, which numbered in the thousands, are like, yay, I was right. He did take off his shoes midway through, you know, whatever. And then when he got to the end, he said to us, um, for those of you who are my really big fans, I'd like to show you some, I call them tchotchkes that we've put together. Here are some t-shirts you can buy. Here are some hats you can buy. Here are some, uh, if you want an actual CD and I'll sign them for you. He had all these things for sale. And he opened up a sale site on where he was. And I forget where the platform was right now. And then he said, as my special gift to you, you get to watch the 2015 show a second time and then I'm gonna sign off. But it's that interactivity and involvement. And so I think what the performing arts really needs to think about is if, to me, it's a scenario of what do we do if we never come back? Because you might as well plan for the worst and be pleased with the, the best that's going to happen. It's what are all the ways that we can touch point all of our consumers and also have them interact with us. And that's what Rosie O'Donnell did. She had people from, from dance and from music and all the different arts, even painters and others on this show for four hours and they just did a donation site. Would you please donate to the arts? And people did. And I think you have to start thinking about the sorts of things that are possible. Um, someone has added to the conversation, Burning Man has decided to go virtual this year, not idea, ideal, but it will keep the community alive and connected. And that's exactly right. You cannot replace Burning Man. I mean, you can't. And there's nothing that could replace it. There's nothing that can replace Coachella because it's the actual human in the experience. But if, if we go back to the earlier question about the nonprofit performing arts, how do you create an experience? And that's what I've been working on for years at GGU is how do we create intimacy through technology? Intimate moments. And, and there is a way to do that. I guarantee you there is. You just need to kind of look at what does this future hold and then put your mind to it and say, what are all the different possibilities that can come up and not negate a one of them? Because if you negate one of them, somebody else will do it. Do we have anything else? These have just been really lovely. You've been Priscilla, do you questions and they've been really great answers. Yeah, no, you answered every single question. I just went up the, the chat just to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Well, so, and I'm appreciative of all the people who've chosen to stay. Thank you. How kind of you to do that. That was really cool. Well, thank you again, Laurie. I think we're just going to, if there's no more questions, I think this is a good place that we wrap things up. As I mentioned to everyone on the chat uh, or in the, in the presentation, we will be emailing a copy of the recording, a survey to let us know how you enjoyed today's webinar. And I'll also include Laurie's contact information so that you can get in touch with Laurie. Thank you. And I, I see some thank yous here. And you're very welcome. Always happy to go over time um, and to share um, my experiences and some of my thinking and to hear your reactions.